Thank you, George, for that lovely introduction. Um, and I am quite delighted to be here. Chimpanzees fascinate scientists and non-scientists alike, in part due to our close evolutionary relationship to them. Along with their sister species, a creature called the bonobo, these two animals are humankind's closest living relatives. We share a common ancestor with them right there at that node, and that node is now estimated to be somewhere between six to nine million years ago. Because of this close evolutionary relationship between us and them, chimpanzees have the potential to provide important insights into that age-old question of what makes us human. Studies of chimpanzees along with the other apes illustrated on this evolutionary tree have now been ongoing for several decades, and as we continue to learn more and more about them, the gap between them and us continues to narrow. So, for example, over 150 years ago, the British anatomist and evolutionist Thomas Henry Huxley noted the close anatomical similarities that exist between us, humans, and the African apes, which include not only bonobos and chimpanzees, but gorillas as well. We essentially have the body plan of an ape. Over 40 years ago, in 1975, Mary Claire King and Alan Wilson compiled what was then known about the genetics of chimpanzees and humans and concluded, quite surprisingly for the time, that not only are we very similar to these animals anatomically, but we're also very, very similar to these animals genetically. Similarities extend to the realm of behavior. Over 50 years ago, Jane Goodall's pioneering observations of chimpanzees making and using tools in the wild forever altered our conception of what it is to be uniquely human. That observation was so revolutionary at the time that it led the famed paleoanthropologist Louis Leakey to comment, now we must redefine tool, redefine man, or accept chimpanzees as humans. Now, for the past 24 years, I've been engaged in a long-term field investigation of a quite remarkable community of chimpanzees that resides here at Ngogo in the Kibali National Park. Kibali is located in the southwest portion of the present-day East African country of Uganda, and our Ngogo study site lies right within the heart of this 800 or so square kilometer park. Now, part of our interest in the particular community of chimps that resides here at Ngogo lies in its extraordinary size and structure. For with nearly 30 adult males and 60 adult females, you can see this community is by far the largest that's been described in the wild thus far. Our studies of the Ngogo chimpanzees continue to challenge our notions of what makes us human. And here are some of our recent observations have provided some intriguing parallels uh, between us and them with respect to two hallmarks of humankind. These include our unusually slow life history characteristics and our equally unusual tendency to cooperate with each other. Now I realize that this is quite a mixed group. Many of you are probably challenged with respect to your knowledge of chimpanzees and their behavior. And for that reason, I would probably repay the effort if I step back for just a second and gave you a brief tutorial into the social lives of these animals. Now, like many other primates, chimpanzees are social creatures. They live in social groups, things that we call communities, and those communities vary wildly in size, from a minimum of 20 individuals to a maximum of over 200 individuals. The interesting thing about these communities, however, is that you'll never find all individuals who live together in a single community at a single spot and at a single time. Instead, they fission, they split apart, they fuse, they come together to form temporary subgroups, things that we call parties that are constantly varying in size and in composition. Now at Gogo, a community of about 200 individuals, average party size runs in and around 10 individuals. As you can see from this distribution of party sizes that we've actually observed at Gogo, there's quite a bit of variability in those subgroup sizes. 
Many of them are quite small. There are a few that are quite large. And here, two things go a long way in helping to explain this variability that you see. One is food. Chimpanzees make a living in the real world by feeding on the sugar-rich fruits that are seasonally abundant in their habitats. And it's during the good times, during periods of high fruit availability, these are the times that our chimps are forming relatively large parties. Now, during the seasonal periods of fruit scarcity, over here, the ecological costs of feeding competition are elevated. And in order to reduce the levels of competition they face, chimps just scatter to the winds, forming much smaller parties in the process. A second factor which helps explain the distribution of party sizes that we see not only at Ngogo, but elsewhere, are these individuals. Specifically, these individuals, females, when they're reproductively active. As things turn out, female chimpanzees in the wild reproduce only very rarely and very slowly. Your average female chimp in the wild makes a, or gives birth to a single live offspring once every five to six years. Now, as I think many of you can imagine, when one of those females rolls into town, males, quite naturally, pay attention. They flock around them, forming large parties in the process, much larger parties than in situations when there are fewer of those reproductively active females around. Now, despite the temporary nature of these parties, you shouldn't be led to believe that they form at random. For we've known for a very long time, beginning with pioneering work of my old friend and colleague, the late Toshisada Nishida, that male chimpanzees are by far the more social sex. These are the individuals that you'll typically find roaming around the forest together in association. Male chimpanzees also engage in affiliative acts, such as these simple acts of social grooming. Male chimpanzees also take an inordinate interest in what others are doing, maintaining close spatial proximity to each other in the process. And it's important to understand that everything I've just told you about the social lives of male chimpanzees generally doesn't apply to the lives of female chimpanzees, especially the ones that I study in East Africa, where females are far less social, far less gregarious. This translates into a situation, because of the relatively shy and secretive habits of these animals, it takes a very long time to build up kind of a picture of what they're actually doing compared to the more social and gregarious male chimpanzees. And it's for this reason, despite the fact that we have well over 400 person years devoted to the study of chimpanzees in the wild now, that we have far fewer, far less data on the lives of these females than we have on males. Okay, with all that as social backdrop, now let me get to what I really want to talk about today. And that's chimpanzee life history and cooperation. We'll begin with a discussion of life history. Now here, we as humans live our lives in a very peculiar and different way than most other animals. We display an unusual suite of life history characteristics. We grow up slowly, we start reproducing relatively late in life, and if some of us are lucky, we live to very old ages. Evidence from the fossil record indicates this is slow pace of life actually is an evolutionary novelty. We have analyses conducted on some of our early human ancestors, things like the famed Lucy skeleton, which I remember was actually displayed in town several years ago, a member of the species Australopithecus afarensis, living in around three to four million years ago. We know that members of this species didn't live their lives in exactly the same way we live our lives today. These guys grew up much more quickly and led shorter lives. Well, it's generally agreed that the slow pace of our lives is an evolutionary novelty. Evaluating that claim depends in part on knowing something about the way our nearest relatives, chimpanzees, actually live their lives. Kim Hill, all the way back in 2001, was the first to try to fill this gap in knowledge. At that time, Kim got all of my colleagues who at the time had been studying chimpanzees for a very long time, 
he gathered the data, which those colleagues of mine had gathered so painstakingly in the field. And with those data, he was able to produce these age-specific survivorship curves. Along the y-axis is the probability of surviving, graphed as a function of age. These survivorship curves indicate three important things. First, they show that there's a slow, steady decline in survivorship with age. Second, they indicate that there's relatively high mortality across the lifespan. And third, if you go out to the end of the x-axis, you will see that none of these chimps living in these five different populations live as long as we do today. While these data are quite interesting, if not illuminating, Kim was quick to realize that there was something odd about them. And that something odd is that the data described in these curves represent declining populations. All of these five populations, which are represented here, have been affected by disease outbreaks, many of which, many of the diseases were actually brought in by us as humans. Um, so these data we know cannot represent what occurred during the course of chimpanzee evolution, because if they did, then there would be no chimpanzees left on Earth. There's obviously chimps here, so something has to be wrong. In order to address the seeming paradox, we've recently completed the first formal demographic analysis of the Ngogo chimpanzee community. And for that analysis, we've used observations collected over 20 years. It involves nearly 300 individuals and 3,000 chimp years. What I'd like to do now is quickly take you through some results regarding chimpanzee survivorship at Ngogo outline some sex differences in survivorship. We'll talk about how long these guys live, and we'll end up by comparing survivorship at Ngogo with what you've just seen at other chimpanzee populations, and also compare how chimpanzees survive at Ngogo with what we see in some traditional hunter-gatherer human populations. Let me begin with the issue of survivorship, and here's that same survivorship curve now plotted for the Ngogo chimpanzees. Same thing shown here as in that previous graph. The probability of surviving along the y-axis graphed as a function of age. The actual estimate is outlined in that solid line. The uh, dotted lines around that solid line represent 95% confidence interval, so that's a measurement of error around those estimates. As you can see from this graph, there's relatively high mortality during the first few years of life, then things more or less level off till about the age 20, at which point in time there's a slow, steady decline in survivorship and the chimps begin to die off. This graph represents what happens when we combine members of both sexes, males and females, and they mass some important sex differences in survivorship, which will instantly become clear when we separate the females in red from the males in whatever that color is. Is that teal? Shall I call it teal? It's supposed to be blue. But now, as you see here in the male curve, they start to die off at that same age of about 20. Things are slightly different in the female curve. They suffer relatively high rates of mortality during the first few years of life. But after that, survivorship is maintained at, a relatively, at relatively high levels all the way to the mid-40s. Taking all this, uh, these analyses together, this leads to a situation where your average chimpanzee at Ngogo is expected to live to about 33 years, although again, there's important sex differences in life expectancy. One of the surprising results from this analysis from Ngogo is seen here. When we compare the Ngogo survivorship curve, again now graphed in teal or blue, and what I've done here is just replot those data from the previous Hill analysis. As you can see, there's a considerable amount of variability in the degree to which chimps survive at these different sites, but survivorship at Ngogo is much higher for much of the lifespan. Taken together, 
this leads to a situation where chimpanzees at Ngogo live much longer lives than chimpanzees elsewhere. Again, notice these sex differences in survivorship. This is simply the um, data from that previous Hill analysis. Perhaps the most shocking thing from all of this is reflected here. What we see when we compare chimpanzee survivorship at Ngogo with survivorship that has been monitored at four hunter-gatherer populations, two in Africa, the Hadza and the Kung, and two in South America, the Ache and the Hiwi. As you can see here, chimpanzee survivorship at Ngogo actually resembles the survivorship curves of human hunter-gatherers more than it does um, chimpanzees living at other sites. And this, in a very real sense, is the money slide. <laughs> to summarize, the Ngogo chimpanzees suffer relatively low rates of mortality throughout their lives and compared to chimps at other sites, and this leads to a situation where life expectancy in the Ngogo chimpanzees is relatively long. The obvious question that emerges from all of this is why do the chimps at Ngogo survive at high, such high rates? And here we think that there's a constellation of factors that conspire together to produce this situation. Now unlike, and until recently, unlo unlike what's happened at many of those other chimpanzee sites that have experienced disease outbreaks, up until recently, the Ngogo chimpanzees have been untouched by this. One famous outbreak occurred several years ago at the Gombe National Park where Jane Goodall studies for now almost 60 years. Early on, there was this polio epidemic which struck down many chimpanzees at Gombe. We can eliminate disease outbreaks as a source of mortality at Ngogo. The second factor which leads to these relatively high survivorship rates at Ngogo lies in the fact that there are no predators at Ngogo. As recently as 40 years ago, there were leopards and lions in the park, but since that time, they've been exterminated. So we can eliminate predation as another source of mortality. A third factor which has contributed to these very high rates of survivorship at Ngogo is found in the fact that these chimps are quite literally living in a chimpanzee paradise with food all around. There's many different kinds of foods, big crops of figs, several different fruit trees, and this constant source of tarragoda leaves that provides protein for these chimps and is available year-round. All these plants are restricted almost exclusively and locally to the Ngogo territory and generally not found in big numbers or in abundance elsewhere in the park. As one example, chimpanzee research has been conducted at Kanyawara, to the north of the park, for several years by Richard Rangham and his colleagues. The Kanyawara study site only lies 10 kilometers away from Ngogo, as the crow flies, yet none of those plants that I've just pointed out actually are found at Kanyawara. This leads to a situation where the C peptide levels of chimpanzees in Ngogo are relatively high and much higher than those of the Kanyawara chimpanzees. C peptide is a, a byproduct of insulin metabolism and it's sometimes used as a biomarker of energy balance. While we've known for many years that the chimpanzees at Ngogo live in a very food rich habitat, we've recently been able to document that things are even getting better. There's over this 20 year period there's been a secular increase in fruit production in this forest. And I don't think it's a coincidence that the secular increase in the amount of food available to the Ngogo chimpanzees matches in almost a one-to-one -one fashion this near exponential growth in the Ngogo chimpanzee community. The group has continued to grow and has grown quite drastically in the last few years. To summarize, we believe that a set of favorable ecological conditions have led to a situation 
where chimpanzee mortality and survivorship at Ngogo is much more similar to humans than it is to other chimpanzees. And in doing so, and in documenting this, I think we've narrowed the gap between them and us with respect to these life history patterns. Let me now turn to a discussion of cooperation. And here, we as humans are an unusually pro-social and cooperative species. We go out of our ways to help each other. Sometimes we help even total strangers. And I think this was nowhere put on better display than right here in Houston after the devastating um, uh, floods you, that you experienced last year where people from all over the country came in to provide some aid and support. Yet here, too, there are some intriguing parallels between chimpanzees and us. Studies of male chimpanzees have been particularly informative in this regard, and this is because male chimpanzees are very well known for forming strong social bonds with each other. A few years ago, in an attempt to address this age-old question about chimps and their behavior, actually a question not posed by me, but one posed by the popular media, I've actually been able to show that specific pairs of male chimpanzees form long-lasting and enduring social bonds with each other, friendships, if you will. A lot of these social bonds are formed between closely related individuals, but many of these friendships are also being formed by totally unrelated individuals. And another important point is that some of these friendships last up to a decade. Male chimpanzees reinforce these friendships by cooperating with each other, and they do so in interactions that take place both between and within groups. Between groups, male chimpanzees cooperate via their group territorial behavior. Within groups, male chimpanzees cooperate by forming short-term coalitions and long-term alliances. Male chimpanzees have also been described to cooperate with each other by sharing meat with their friends, meat that they obtain in hunts. Why do male chimpanzees cooperate with each other in so many and different and varied contexts? Well, here kinship plays a very important role. In some research that we conducted several years ago, we've been able to show that male chimpanzees who are related to each other closely at the level of maternal half-sibs, so they share the same mother, have different fathers, these are the individuals who are cooperating selectively with each other in all those different contexts that I just outlined, much more so than unrelated individuals. I've also been able to show that males related to each other at that same level, maternal half-sibs, also form longer-lasting friendships than do unrelated individuals. While kinship goes a very long way in helping to explain who cooperates with whom and how frequently, it's important to understand that unrelated individuals also cooperate with each other. They do so often in coalitionary behavior, and these coalitions involve situations where two or more individuals will direct aggression toward a third party. Alternatively, in a situation where fight erupts between two individuals, a third party will intervene, taking one side or the other. That third party will take the side of his friend, typically. And these coalitions are very important. They're very important because they play an integral role in the acquisition and maintenance of high dominance rank. Like many other primates, male chimpanzees form linear dominance hierarchies. Some males rise to the top. Others fall to the bottom. And males who rise to the top, and especially the alpha position, oftentimes get to the top only because they're able to solicit and recruit this coalitionary support. Now, if all of this sounds familiar, <laughs> there might be a reason. I'm not sure what that reason might be. But getting back to chimpanzees, they use this coalitionary support they use this coalitionary support to get to the top, get to the alpha position, and high rank is important for male chimpanzees 
because at the end of the day, this plays an important role in reproduction. With high-ranking male chimpanzees, high-ranking male chimpanzees reproducing far more than lower-ranking chimpanzees. One of the most dramatic examples of cooperation in the chimpanzee world takes place in the context of their territorial behavior. And here, like many other animals, chimpanzees are territorial beasts. Interactions between uh, members of different communities are typically hostile. The unusual thing about chimpanzee territoriality is that sometimes those hostilities escalate. They escalate to the point where somebody falls victim. For male chimpanzees are very well known for launching lethal coalitionary attacks on their neighbors. Now, boundary patrol behavior is an integral part of chimpanzee territoriality. And what happens here is really, really interesting. Now, imagine for a second you're out with me. We're following a group of chimps. A few of them might be socializing. A few others might be feeding. Some others might be calling to each other in the distance. Continue to watch those chimpanzees. You might notice a few of them, typically male, rise. They move off in single file fashion in the forest. They can move 100 meters, 200 meters, a kilometer or more until they reach the boundary of their territory. When they arrive there, their demeanor, their behavior it changes, and it changes quite dramatically. Everybody falls completely silent. They start sniffing the ground. They start scanning the treetops. They become attentive to any and all motion in the treetops. Sometimes the chimpanzees will continue on. They'll continue on making a deep incursion into the territories of their neighbors. What the chimps appear to be doing is seeking signs, if not contact, with those neighbors. These patrols, again, is one of the most striking behavior displayed by chimpanzees in the wild. These, these patrols don't happen every day. Once on average, every 10 or so days. And because they don't happen every day, it's taken a really long time to develop a picture of what's actually going on in terms of who participates, what's actually involved, how long they go for, when they go, and why they go. After several years of observations, I can now answer each and every one of these questions. Beginning with the issue of participation, we know from studies at Ngogo and elsewhere that this is principally a male affair involving both adult and adolescent males who gather together in patrols that average in and around 13 individuals. We know from studies conducted by my former graduate student, Marissa Sobolewski, that male chimpanzees on patrol, they literally, quite literally get jacked up on testosterone when on patrol. Their testosterone levels skyrocket and are elevated above baseline. Perhaps even more interestingly, their testosterone levels show an anticipatory spike just prior to going out above and beyond baseline? We know that these are non-trivial affairs, lasting on average about two hours and covering about two and a half kilometers. By way of comparison, if you're out with me, we follow a chimpanzee from the time it rises, follow it till the time it goes to bed, trace that linear distance that it traversed during the course of that day, we will have generally covered anywhere between three to four kilometers. So that two and a half kilometer figure is relatively long, at least by chimpanzee standards. We've also known for a very long time that there's seasonal variation in the occurrence of patrols. There are some months when they're patrolling all the time, yet there are other months that they don't patrol at all. Several years ago, we conducted a series of analyses where we examined any one of a number of different social and ecological factors to try to help explain why the chimps went when they did. And when we did that, we discovered that the single factor that best predicted whether chimpanzees would patrol is this factor, male party size. They go out when they're gathered together with a lot of their friends. They do so for an obvious reason. These patrols are dangerous. They run the risk of injury while on patrol. Worst case scenario, somebody can die. But chimpanzees here, like the Golden State Warriors, who are ready to take down the Houston Rockets locally, they find strength in numbers, if not safety in numbers, and they only patrol to reduce the risk of those patrols when they're gathered together in large parties. 
I didn't get necessarily the reaction I thought I was going to get with that. <laughs> no basketball fans in here? Yeah. Nervous laughs. We're at a disadvantage. We're way far away from you. <laughs> Am I going to get kicked out of here now? <laughs> Additional work by some of my former graduate students, including Sylvia Amsler, indicate that there are other costs to be paid. Sylvia, several years ago, uh, showed that these things entail energy costs because chimps on patrol travel significantly more and feed significantly less than during match control periods. And additional work by Marissa has indicated that there are physiological costs to be paid insofar as male patrollers display elevated levels of cortisol while on patrol above and beyond baseline. Cortisol is a so-called stress hormone it's a physiological marker of stress. Now, given that all these costs are involved in patrolling, quite natural question that arises, why do chimps even do this? After about 10 years of study, we came up with an answer. And part of the answer lies in the fact that from time to time, contact with the neighbors is made. Many of these contacts involve contact over distance. You're on patrol. The chimps hear chimps, other chimps, their neighbors in the distance. When they hear a bunch of other chimps in the distance, chimpanzees are scared, they're chicken, they just turn around. They hightail it back to where they came from. But in some very rare instances where patrollers far outnumber the neighbors encountered, and when those patrollers have overwhelming numerical superiority, over those neighbors found. These are the situations where male chimpanzees will launch these lethal coalitionary attacks. One such attack is sort of being illustrated here. A group of males from Ngogo have been on patrol. They've caught, they've isolated a single male from another group. They're in the process of killing that male. The victim is hidden underneath this pile of about 13 males. Those 13 males continually pound that male from the other group. And over the short space of about 14, 15 minutes, the victim lies dead. As things turn out, the chimpanzees that I study in Gogo have the dubious distinction of being the world record holders for killing others. Over the course of about 20 years, we've witnessed them kill many individuals from neighboring groups. Many of those victims have come from an area to the northeast of the Ngogo chimpanzee territory. And in a dramatic series of events that occurred in 2009, the Ngogo chimpanzees, after having reduced the coalitionary strength of those neighbors to the northeast through killing so many of them, simply moved in, took over this big chunk of land, which was once previously occupied by those neighbors. That area of territorial expansion is about six square kilometers, representing a 20 or so percent increase in the Ngogo chimpanzee territory. Returning to the issue of cooperation, recently we've tried to grapple with a problem that we've known about for a very long time, that have only now recently been able to deal with, and that problem is represented here. We've known for a very, very long time that these males patrol, but not everybody contributes equally. As you can see here, there are some males who patrol quite often. Yet there are other males on the opposite side of the spectrum who hardly patrol at all. Now when you see data like these, you're confronted with a classic cooperation or collective action problem. And this is something that I think all of us can readily understand and identify with because we encounter things like this all the time. I work at the University of Michigan. I'm a single member of a fairly large department. There's about 40 other of my colleagues in this department. 10% of us do pretty much 90% of the work. And conversely, 10% of us cause 90% of the problems. Um, I'm sure that there are many of you to, here today from the business world where the same thing applies. There are individuals who do the work, and there are others who do what? They slouch, they, slur, they uh, shirk, they um, slack. 
Question remains, though, is why do we allow such individuals to persist, essentially reaping the communal benefits derived through cooperation without paying any of the cost? A potential answer to this problem was provided several years ago in the middle part of the last century, in 1965, by an economist, Mancure Olson, who in 1965 published this influential book, a book called The Logic of Collective Action. In this book, Olson proposed that one way to get around these collective action or cooperation problems, such as the one posed by male chimpanzee uh, territorial boundary patrol behavior, is through what he called the exploitation of the great by the small. In many situations, there will be um, individuals who might be motivated to cooperate and contribute to the collective insofar as they stand more to gain. Alternatively, in those same populations, there might be individuals in a better position to absorb the cost of the cooperation, thereby motivating them to pitch in there and also provide the communal good as a byproduct to free riders. Our observations in the Ngogo chimpanzees largely fit with this idea because here, males who have produced the most kids and thereby stand the most to gain in terms of protecting the territory themselves as well as all those kids generally patrol much more often than males who produce fewer kids. On the cost side of the ledger, high-ranking males who are typically in much better condition than low-ranking males and are thus perhaps able to absorb the energetic cost of patrols. These are the individuals who are patrolling much more frequently than lower-ranking males. While these observations conform and are consistent with the logic of collective action, additional analyses are also um, consistent with another key part of Olson's thesis, and this applies to the so-called group size paradox, the idea that cooperation is oftentimes difficult to achieve, difficult to achieve in large groups. This is because in large groups, defections by single individuals a very little impact on the probability of success and the probability that the communal good is actually going to be provided. Here too, I think this is something a lot of us can understand and easily relate to. It's something I confront all the time in the classroom. I see some students here um, in my classrooms from time to time. I assign group projects. Sometimes when I make those group pro projects, I pair up students in twos. When I do that, I'm more or less guaranteed that those projects are going to be done because both of those individuals are going to contribute. If one and one opts out, one or the other opts out, there's going to be a price to pay. But in situations when I assign a group project and I make that group project involving five, six, seven, eight students, invariably what will happen is that one individual will look around the situation, typically a male, <laughs> He'll, it will be, see that there's Tom, Dick, Harry, Mary Jane, and Gertrude also in the group. He will say to himself, I have something better to do with my life. <laughs> the temptation to cheat in these large groups is magnified. Problem is that if everybody takes that attitude, then cooperation is going to dissolve. I'll remind you that over time, the Ngogo chimpanzee community has increased in size. The number of males has increased hand in hand with that increase in male in size. And our observations here, as that male group size has increased, largely conform to the group size paradox insofar <laughs> as individual male participation has decreased, but despite conforming to the predictions of the group size paradox here, it's important to understand that the collective good is still being provided. The collective good and the communal good, defense of the territory, is still maintained insofar as aggregate patrolling effort across the entire group more or less is held constant 
as a function of male group size. In other words, the predicted negative relationship between these two variables as predicted by the group size pr paradox doesn't seem to be going on. We think these results are really, really important because they indicate that male chimpanzees at Ngogo are motivated to protect the group and maintain the group at as large a size possible because at the end of the day, everybody stands to gain. And here, everybody stands to gain because everybody in this very large group is able to reproduce. Here we have a situation where there are 30, 40 males competing to mate and reproduce. And in a situation like that, it's virtually impossible for the alpha male to control the situation and command all the matings and reproduction. And at Ngogo, over time, we've documented this sustaining figure. Your average male at Ngogo produces three kids across his entire lifetime. And this differs. It differs quite dramatically from what we see in much smaller communities, much smaller communities, such as the Gombe Stream National Park, site of Jane Goodall's work, where over the past 60 years, they've had a relatively small community of chimps never more than 10 males. And in those situations where there are only about 10 males, it's relatively easy for the alpha male to take everything under control and to, in fact, dominate reproduction. I'll return to where I started and the question of what makes us human. Several years ago, in pondering this issue, when asking questions about the differences that exist between us humans and our closest living uh, relatives, the apes, Thomas Henry Huxley wrote that it would be no less wrong than absurd to deny the existence of this chasm, the fact that there's a gap between us and them, but it is at least equally wrong and absurd to exaggerate its magnitude and resting on the admitted fact of its existence refuse to inquire whether it is wide or narrow. I hope I've been able to convince you over these last few minutes that that gap undoubtedly exists, but it's a lot smaller and a lot narrower than most people believe. I would not be able to live with myself if I left you here tonight if I didn't comment on the plight and conservation status of these animals, not only chimpanzees, but all primates. That plight, in a word, is grim because the majority of all primates across the world stand at the brink of extinction. The reasons for this are straightforward. Habitat destruction at the hand of man, a thriving bushmeat trade, and recurrent outbreaks of infectious disease have decimated populations of primates across the globe. I'm actually moving into the end of my field career. I've had a long and quite successful 40-year field career. And when I think back on all the things that I've done, the one thing that I always come back to is how incredibly lucky I've been. I've had an opportunity to study all the animals that are represented on this slide, all of our closest living relatives, the apes, I've been to places, I've done and seen things that most people can only dream of. But what I feared for a very long time and what I continue to fear today is that these kinds of opportunities that I was given aren't going to be there in the future. And they aren't going to be there in the future because we're rapidly moving from a world that looks like this to a world that looks like this a world that's completely devoid of apes. I hope in the past few minutes I've been able to give you a deeper sense of and appreciation for the animals that I study. And I also hope that you will take this newfound knowledge, you'll take this newfound knowledge and go on and do something. Do something to ensure that you, your children, and your children's children will continue to live in a world full of these magnificent creatures. Knowledge is power. And in the words of the um, Senegalese environmentalist, Baba Diume, we will conserve only what we love, 
We will love only what we understand, and we will understand only what we are taught. Thank you very much for your time and your attention tonight.